cattle country of Patagonia lies deep in the Argentine, a thousand miles south of Buenos Aires. But these men who brand their stock in a valley of the southern Andes, halfway between Rio Negro and Santa Cruz, these South American gauchos are men with unlikely names. Evan Jones. This one is Ernest Freeman. The best bronco rider in the whole valley, Handel Jones. Eilir Hughes. Arthur Jones. They speak Spanish and Welsh. Their great-grandfathers opened up some of the toughest country in South America. The Welsh gauchos are easy to pick out. Riding into town, Eric and Vincent Evans talk to each other in Welsh much as it was spoken in Wales more than a century ago. These men are the inheritors of a dream. Patagonia was Indian territory, the land of the Aracaunos, the Tewelches and the Onas. On the pampa of Patagonia, the forefathers of these Indians hunted and rode to war. The Argentine government was bound to view the ambition of the settlers with concern. In the early days, it kept its promise to help with stocks and supplies. But as early as 1878, it began to curb the Welsh dream by insisting that Spanish should be spoken in the schools. As the years went by, the idea of Argentine nationhood and the nationalist ideals of the Welsh were in head-on conflict. The government of 1860 had wanted the land of Patagonia pioneered, but from the first insisted that the Welsh had to become Argentinian. Lewis Jones had turned a hopefully blind eye to this. But the government still respected the Welsh. And one of the chief towns in Patagonia is Trelew, Welsh for the town of Lewis, after Lewis Jones. The early settlers resisted authority, refusing to do militia duty against the Indians who had taught them to hunt. They refused to do arms drill on Sundays. But their descendants couldn't resist the influence of the growing number of settlers from other nations. The future was not to be all theirs. It was the Welsh who opened up the wool trade with Buenos Aires. Today, trucks carry the bales the thousand miles north to the markets of the capital city. The railway that later Welsh settlers built to serve the valley couldn't compete with road transport, and now the engines rust away in the building commemorates the name of Richard Berwin, first schoolmaster and first editor of the handwritten newspaper. Nearby, the first stone houses to be built on the pamper still stand. The co-op the farmers set up for imports and exports is now the property of a chain store. St. David's Hall, once the place for Eistedd Vodai, now houses an athletic club. Today, the Welsh have 16 chapels dotted over Patagonia, but in recent years, ministers from Wales have been slow to go out to South America. At the moment, there is only one pastor. Nonconformity, the old driving force, is overshadowed. In the cemetery outside Trelew, where some of the old leaders lie buried, the pampas grass comes creeping back. The inscriptions could be those of a country churchyard in Wales. The fire of Abraham Matthew's Welsh sermons has gone. The words of the Spanish Bible echo over the congregations in the Welsh chapel. Venid, comprad sin dinero y sin precio, vino y leche. ¿Por qué gastáis el dinero no en pan? Y vuestro trabajo no en altura. 
oídme atentamente y comed del bien y deleitaráse vuestra alma con grosura. Inclinad vuestros oídos y venid a mí. He aquí que llamarás a gente que no conociste y gentes que no te conocieron correrán a ti. Many of the young people prefer the service to be in Spanish. They understand it better. The old people wait for the Welsh hymns that once enchanted the Indians. Welsh language is slowly dying in Patagonia, and most young people aren't very worried. They've never seen Wales, and there are more urgent problems than what language they speak. Nearly every winter, the river Chubut floods its shallow banks, damaging many acres of farmland. Across 800 miles of near desert, Welshmen pushed into the Andes towards the borders of Chile. Their main township is Esquel. The first families settled in the Andes at the end of the last century, drawing lots for their tracts of land. Later, the Welsh were honoured when, in a dispute over whether the land they occupied belonged to Chile or to the Argentine, the pioneers said they regarded themselves as Argentinian. So this rich wool and cattle country went to the Argentine on a Welsh vote. The winter climate of snow makes for richer pastures, and there's a greater wealth here than among the farmers of the valley. Distances too are greater. Ranches and journeys are measured not in miles, but in leagues. Overgrazing by the heavy merino sheep, the hot winds that blow in summer, and the rain and snow that wash away the topsoil of the valleys in winter, together these things cause erosion. But it's the law of gavel kind that is beginning to loosen the hold of the Welsh settlers on the land. Every death means a division of land and of the original dream. Not enough settlers went out to allow their children and their children's children to intermarry. Today, about 5,000 people of Welsh descent live in Patagonia. Slowly, they merge with the rest of the Argentine. Their language is dying. But the Welsh opened up Patagonia. Perhaps only an ambition born of that wild dream could ever have done it. With thorn stumps on the lean shelves of the desert, they worked out the plots for their lives.